In these days of unsettled times, chaos is at the door, and the cup of judgment is fermenting. But what are we to do in the meantime? As Christians, the people of God must get a hold of Jesus and his promises. And today's message is going to offer spiritual nutrition to those that are hungry for such a time as this. Welcome to Nathan Liao's For Such a Time as This, sermons that will strengthen you, encourage you, and give you hope in these end times. It is the year 2015, and if you are hungry for the things of God, this message is for you. Folks, I know that it's hard out there. Things seem to be developing, and in other areas, things seem to be deteriorating. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very important that we maintain our spiritual strength, or maybe you've lost it. Maybe you're not as strong as you used to be. Some of you are are walking in disappointment, or maybe even worse, you're battling oppression or, or depression because Things just seem so hard. God sees you where you are, my friend. He knows that there are some of you that are alone. So this message is going to benefit those of you who are spiritually hungry. I know that there are a lot of you out there. Some of you are wondering if you have what it takes to be an overcomer. Some of you are wondering if you have what it takes to endure. Because you see how hard it's getting. You see the challenges that are ahead. But my friend, I want you to know that you can. Because when we are weak, then... He can be strong in our lives. As you saw in the title of this message, it's called Jesus, the Bread of Life. I'm excited to bring it to you. So I want to ask you to get your Bible, get a pen and paper, and take a lot of notes. We're going to get very, very deep in the scriptures. We're not just going to read the surface layer. We're going to go deep. And I'm going to share some things that are going to bless you and that I am very excited about. So I want to encourage you to follow along and study with me. And also share this information with your family members. This is going to be an exciting series. I'm calling it the Feeding of the Multitude series. And the purpose of this message is to feed you spiritual food. Not just a little sip of milk from a straw. We're going to dine on T-bone steak today. So get your Bibles and listen to this message more than once if you have to. And I want to encourage you to do that. And also if you this message blesses you, let me know. Send me an email and let me know what you think because it's encouraging to know that the efforts that we do here at Watchman's Cry are reaching those of you that are out there. So with that, I present to you part one of the series, Jesus Feeds the Multitude. And God bless you. I'm reading from the book of Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to read the account of the feeding of the 5,000. And we're about to embark on a journey that's going to be incredible and that's going to bless you in multiple ways. Matthew chapter 14, verse 12. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now before the account of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus had just found out that John the Baptist had been killed. He had been beheaded, and after the disciples of John the Baptist came and told him. The account begins in verse 13. And it says, When Jesus heard it, which is that John the Baptist was killed, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening... His disciples came to him and they said, This is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. And Jesus said, Bring them here to me. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave 
to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Now before I start, I just want to say a prayer and ask God to bless Heavenly Father. I ask you to bless your word and open up our eyes as we look into the scriptures. Father God, there are a lot of people out there that are hungry. There's a lot of people that are alone. There's a lot of people that need direction, that need guidance from you. God, I just pray that as we look into this word, that your Holy Ghost presence would be in this message and that you would anoint the words. And God, every person listening, I pray that you would touch them, minister to them. And also, God, for those that need to be drawn towards you, Lord, let your word do it. Let your Holy Spirit do his work. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, that is the account that we find in the book of Matthew. And this miracle is found in all four Gospels. It's also found in Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through 44. And then it's found in Luke chapter 9, verse 10 through 17. And it's found in the book of John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And as we go through this study... I'm going to make reference to some of the other accounts that are found in the other three books besides Matthew. So we're going to be jumping around. and We're also going to go into the Old Testament. And this is going to be an in-depth Bible study. By the time we're done, you're going to find yourself filled with great spiritual nourishment. Now, when we first look at the account of the feeding of the 5,000, if you've been a Christian long enough, you have heard a lot of sermons about this miracle. There's a lot of great spiritual truths that we can glean from the, the miracle of the feeding of the multitude. And just on the surface, we see the miracle of what Jesus was able to do. He was able to take a few loaves of bread and some fish and multiply it. Now, you may be wondering, how did he do that? I've wondered the same thing. I've wondered if Jesus had one of the loaves in his hand and maybe there was part of it sticking out the, the front of his hand and he would cut off a piece and drop it into the basket, and then he would cut off another piece. Did the loaf in his hand never shrink? I've wondered how it happened, and however it did happen, we know that he multiplied the loaves somehow. I don't know how it looked or if the people could actually see it growing every time he took a piece off that it seemed like nothing was removed. I don't know, but if a person was standing next to Jesus looking over his shoulder, it must have been something incredible to see. And as I was saying, over the years, many sermons have been preached about this miracle. And for the most part, the focus on the topic of the feeding of the multitudes has to do with God being able to provide for us. He can feed us no matter where we are. He, he's able to provide a miracle. If you need food, he's able to provide that. We should take the same example and feed others when we can and help others. The theme seems to be many times in sermons that use this passage as a, as a reference, the theme seems to be the feeding of people or provision from God or giving food to others. And on the surface, it does say that. But the thing that's incredible about the Word of God is that the Word of God is alive. That's found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things, but the beginning portion of this verse says it is living and powerful. Now, how can that be? Here's what it is, folks. Have you ever noticed that sometimes if maybe your, your body's feeling weak, maybe you're tired or you're sick or your brain is just feeling foggy, you're in a foggy mood, you're not quite there. Have you noticed that when you read the Bible, it's boring. It's just the words on a page. And you open it up and read it and then close it. I've heard Christians say that a lot. They say, you know, the Bible is boring. I don't understand it and I don't see the point. Now, we've all been there, folks. And the reason for that is because our spirit is not in tune. Our spirit's not awake. Our spirit is not in the right place. And often that will happen when maybe a person is in a different mode. You're in, in the, the mode of the natural you know, doing the regular things that you do, driving to work, doing chores around the house, physical labor or things where your mind is occupied about natural things of the earth. 
or maybe you're dealing with some people at work or the atmosphere isn't the most pure atmosphere. And in those times, sometimes the wick in your inner spirit is a little bit dim. So when a person's spirit is not totally charged up and they read the scriptures, it may seem boring. But then have you noticed, folks, when you go to church or you go to a worship service or a prayer meeting and you start singing worship songs, praise songs, and your heart starts delighting in the things of God, and you sing one song and then another song, or you have praise music playing. Maybe you're in your prayer closet and you're playing music that is worshipful. And then if you find yourself beginning to sing along and worship, then the lamp within you starts growing because your spirit is drawing towards the things of God. And it's during those moments when your spirit starts then getting hungrier for God. And for those of you that have done this, you go to a church service that has Holy Ghost worship that is anointed and the presence of God comes into the room because everyone's worshiping, or maybe you're in a prayer meeting or a home cell group. And have you noticed, folks, when the Spirit comes into the room and the mood will change and the presence of God will start to grow, you can feel His presence, and it's a beautiful, comforting feeling that words cannot describe. And what's happening then is your Spirit is entering into the the holy place of God. Your Spirit is going into the holy of holies of God, and it's drawing nearer to God. And it's in those moments then when the preacher starts sharing a word from the Lord. Have you noticed, folks? The word becomes real. The appetite within will increase. So you want to get something from God. You want to get a word from the Lord that feeds your spirit. Have you noticed that, folks? And the word of God is able to do that. It's alive, but our spirits also need to be hungry and get to the place where they're worshipful and desiring to get something from God. And it's in those moments when our spirit is in tune that the Bible becomes alive. And this is what I was getting at. For those whose spirits are not hungry or desiring of the things of God, and for the people that do not seek to understand the things of God, when they look at the scriptures, all they're going to see is words on a page. But if you are hungry, you want your eyes to be open, you want to understand the secrets and the treasures that are found in the scripture, God can show you those things, and he will give you a desire to want more and more. So when we are reading the scriptures and we are in the attitude of prayer, we are in the moment of wanting things from God, and our spirit is open to it and hungry for it, then God does something that is supernatural, and it is a powerful experience. It's a powerful thing that he's able to do. And I want to qualify this. If you have not been born again and you read the Bible, it's going to just be the letters on a page. It will seem dead. But when we're born again, God opens our eyes. He quickens our spirit. The Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead quickens our spirit and raises us from being spiritually dead. Our spirit opens up as a new creation with spiritual eyes that also have a spiritual appetite for the things of God. Have you noticed that, folks? When you first got saved, you remember that? You wanted to just devour the Word of God? Did that happen to you? That happened to me. When I was 17, I got saved. I came out of the world. I was a long-haired, heavy metal addict, partier from the 70s, hair growing halfway down my back. I didn't look like the kind of person that uh, a gal would want to take home to her mama. That's how I was when Jesus got a hold of me. And when he saved me, I had a desire to devour the Word of God. I couldn't get enough. I would read 10, 20, 30 chapters a day. I would spend hours reading because I just wanted more and more. And it it would seem like it was a never-ending meal a steak dinner it was so incredible because before the when the bible was dead to me after i got saved it was like wow this is great those of you that have been saved you know what i'm talking about if you had a a true rebirth experience with jesus you know what i'm talking about now some of you aren't sure what i'm talking about and you say nathan that never happened to me i never really was that hungry for the word of god well if that may be you my friend i want to encourage you that you can get there it just takes a desire It takes praying to God. It takes going into the prayer closet and saying, God, open my eyes. Fill me with a hunger for you. I want to know you, Jesus. And also when you're praying, it's also important to deal with the sin aspect. Make sure that that you have a discipline to repent when you go and pray. You know, a lot of people will, will go and pray. They'll have their own session. But their prayers are mainly just a letter to Santa. It's just a bunch of requests instead of dealing with the inner things first. When we pray to God, folks, we need to deal with the matters of the heart first. Make sure that you clean the slate with the blood of Jesus. So that's step one. You, Jesus, 
forgive me for this sin or that sin. If you are aware of sins you've done, ask him to forgive you. And also, and God also for the sins that I'm not aware of, also show those to me. So I don't want to deviate from this message on the uh, elementary things. But what I'm saying is the word of God, when we are in the place where we are hungry for him, it will be alive. And what happens is that when we are looking at the scriptures, it's incredible, folks. Let's say there's a verse that is made up of two or three sentences. When you are in the mode where you are hungry for Jesus and you set yourself alone with him, you're in your prayer closet, you want to get spiritual nourishment. While you're reading one verse, each word of the verse can lift itself off of the pages and it will affect your heart or your mind or it will bring things to memory or it will stir you or maybe they will convict you or remind you of things that you haven't done or it's incredible folks what the word of God can do or if the words don't have an effect from that aspect what they also can do is they can bring to mind other portions of the Bible the verse that you're reading may cross-reference itself to another verse you had been reading a month previous or six months or a year before and and then all of a sudden the two verses together will make sense and it's like it's one of those eureka moments where it's like Oh, wow, that's what it means. And it's in those times where the Bible shows itself to be real because it's so incredible what it does to our inner spirit, to our soul, or down into our joints and marrow. Just like Hebrews 4, 12 says, the word of God is living and powerful. It is alive. Here's the other thing about the word of God. The word of God has secret nuggets hidden within the words of the pages. I have experienced countless times where I will be reading an account of Jesus or maybe somewhere in the Old Testament and it's like all of a sudden as I'm looking at one word it's like God downloads a whole page or two pages or a chapter 10 pages 50 pages of information all at once from the nugget that is found in the pages or in the verse if some of you are saying well Nathan that doesn't happen to me I want to challenge you with this try to get into the habit of seeking God. And when you're praying to him, ask him to open your blind eyes. Before you read the Bible, say, God, open my blind eyes. Show me your treasures. Show me the nuggets that are in here. I want to know, God. I want to know your secrets. And the incredible thing is that God also wants to show us his secrets. He wants to open our blind eyes. He wants us to understand. He wants you to get it. Because the more we understand, the more we can share with others. And and it brings growth to our inner spirit and our soul. And when the word comes alive and God gives us another nugget, the value is immeasurable. When I was studying the account of the feeding of the multitude that we just read here in Matthew 14, I asked God for that. I would read it and verse by verse, sentence by sentence, it seems like every other word God was making another nugget pop out in this account of the feeding of the multitude. And so far from this one miracle that's found in Matthew chapter 14, 13 through 21, that's just eight verses, those few verses, I was able to find below the surface layer. And by the way, this thing goes down many, many layers, folks. It's incredible. But in the account of the feeding of the multitude, I have been able to find the Great Commission I have been able to find the explanation of the gospel that begins all the way back in the books of Moses and forward all the way to the book of Revelation, the Great Commission. I was able to find the types and the shadows that are found in the Old Testament that have to do with Jesus and even some of the the verses that we have become very familiar with. They jumped out from this account. For example, there is a portion of the 23rd Psalm here in the feeding of the multitudes. There is also references to the temple of God and how God dwells with his people. There's a lot of stuff in here, folks. And so I just want to say that up front. This account could be a whole book. So today our focus is going to be Jesus, the bread of life. Now, when Jesus first found out about John the Baptist being killed, we read in verse 13 that he wanted to depart and go to a deserted place by himself. So he got on a boat, and his plan was to cross the Sea of Galilee and go to the north, north by northeastern corner of the Sea of Galilee, which is located at about maybe one o'clock. 
at the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was headed for a little fishing village called Bethsaida. Now, in verse 13, it says he was going by boat to a deserted place. And in the account of Luke, chapter 9, it tells us the name of the village in the deserted place. It says, Luke 9, 10, And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. So, there it is right there, the location. So the deserted place that we read in Matthew 14 is called Bethsaida. Now, I noticed that they make reference to a deserted place. And when all the people found out that Jesus was going to Bethsaida, the Sea of Galilee is a sea that you can look across. It's small enough that you could see from one end to the other. And you know where someone's going to end up. So when they saw the boat of Jesus going to the one o'clock part of the Sea of Galilee. By the way, he took off at the area of the south southwest. Maybe it would be at about the seven o'clock position. And when the people saw the direction he was going, they ran along the shoreline and they, they got there before he did. And it must have been interesting as they were on the boat and they could see the people running to get to the other side. So when Jesus got to Bethsaida, he wanted to just go rest. So he got off the boat and he went not to the village itself, but to the outskirts of Bethsaida. And the word Bethsaida, it's an interesting word. The word means house of fish. The house of fish. It was a fishing village. A lot of fishermen were from there and a lot of fishermen would take their, their fish and to the market there. And it was also the home of Andrew and Peter and Philip and John. The thing that I want to stress is that every word has more than just a surface meaning. There is information that is under the surface layer. So when we see that Jesus went to the fishing village of Bethsaida and that the name of the village is House of Fish, that is significant. Now, why is that? Well, when we look at a lot of the prophecies or things that happen in the scriptures, there's a lot of symbolism that goes on. For example, Folks, have you ever wondered what the meaning of all the fish are? You know, when, when Jesus rose again and he said, throw your net on the other side to the disciples who were fishing, and they did, and they caught so many fish that they could barely drag it in. The net didn't tear, but they had 153 fish. You remember that account at the end of John when Jesus rose again? Well, aside from them catching a lot of fish and obeying Jesus gets you a lot of fish and provision if you obey him, there is double meaning and triple meaning and subsurface meanings of a lot of things, including fish. When Jesus first called the early disciples who were fishermen, Peter was a fisherman, Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. So the reference between fish and men was given to us by Jesus. So when Jesus went to the house of fish and he was in the outskirts, this is where the feeding of the 5,000 took place. It was in the outskirts of the house of fish. And all the people came. They met him there. Now, think about this, folks. Jesus got on a boat from the southwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. He crosses it. And by the time he gets to the other side, where Bethsaida is, 5,000 people had assembled waiting for him. Now, that is a pretty large crowd. And by the way, that's, according to this account, besides women and children. And we read that a moment ago. There were 5,000 men plus women and children. So if you figure that at least half the men were married, so you add that many women who are married, and then, of course, the unmarried. So that's another maybe three or 4,000. That takes us up to nine. And then how many of those families had children? And back in those days, people didn't just have one kid. They had a quiver full. So we're talking over 10,000, at least 10, 12, 13 thousand people were waiting for Jesus. This is a big crowd. And when Jesus saw them, how did he look at them? Did he see them as, oh man, I wanted to rest. I wanted to go to the other side. And now look, I have another presentation. I have another seminar, another conference, another sermon. Oh man, is that how Jesus saw them? Well, the account in Mark chapter six says, well, let me start at verse 33. When the multitude saw them departing, Many knew him and ran there on foot from the cities. From all the cities, they arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out of the boat, saw a great multitude. Now watch this, folks. Was Jesus annoyed? It says, 
he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them. He was moved. Why? Because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. Jesus was moved when he saw the people because he is the Messiah. And the purpose for him coming first to the house of Israel was to minister to the house of Israel, to them as Messiah, to show them that he was Messiah, and to also bring redemption to those who had no Messiah. Because up to this point in the biblical narrative, mankind was still waiting for the Messiah. And if we go back and look at the history of Israel, Israel had been surviving and enduring a pretty bumpy ride up to that point when Jesus was born. Because before Jesus showed up about 2,000 years ago, Israel had gone through a dark period of about 400 years where there was no word of God. There were not that many prophets walking around. There wasn't a lot of miracles taking place. There wasn't a lot of spiritual activity going on during this time. It was kind of like the dark ages for Israel. The Roman Empire had taken over the world and was occupying Israel. And before they had showed up, the Grecian Empire had done the same thing. They had their turn in the narrative of history. And then if we go back beyond 400 years, what we have is Israel broken up, the northern kingdom from the south, and Israel returning from Babylon and trying to rebuild. See, folks, you go back far enough, they came from Babylon, which was at that time Persia. Persia let them go free and sent many of them back home. Some of them did not want to return home, so they stayed in Persia. And to this day, there are, there are descendants of the tribes that stayed there, which means, ladies and gentlemen, think about this. There are descendants of the captives who are still living in Persia or Iran and in Babylon or Iraq. So Iraq and Iran have descendants from Israel still living there to this day. And here's another thing that's interesting. This is a brain twister. Some of the descendants who live in Iraq or Persia, Iran, may not know that they're descendants, or some of them are now Christians. So it's real interesting that in all the wars that we're having, you know, there's a tendency here in the West to just throw all the Iranians in one basket. They're Iranians, they're Persians, who cares? We should nuke them. We should kill them. Same thing with Iraq. The Middle East is just a bunch of Muslims, Hajis, Muzzies, and we just need to kill all of them. That is part of the temperature that is spoken, folks, here in America. It is. The Fox News Republicans want to kill all of them. But some of the Christians and descendants of Israel are living not only there, but also in Syria. They're living in Lebanon. They're living in Jordan. They're all over the place. Side note, folks, we have brethren everywhere. But as I was saying, when we go back far enough, Israel had a bumpy ride to where they were taken away captive, and then they returned home. And then if we go backwards from there, they're living in Babylon. And then if we keep going backward, then we have them being taken by Nebuchadnezzar as captives. Then before that, Israel went through a lot of bad kings. Israel was broken up into two parts. You have the northern kingdom and in, in in Judah in the south. And they went through a lot of kings who were evil, who were secular, who didn't obey God. And the prophets were always trying to tell them to come around and they didn't. So when we move forward, we see that Israel didn't always have a great history. So when Jesus saw the multitudes, he saw them as the descendants of the mess I just described. The descendants of people who did not always understand the things of God and the descendants of those who were rebellious to God. And when Jesus saw them, he saw them as people who were lost, having no shepherd, lost sheep. But not only that. Now, Let's talk about the desolate place where they were. They were in the outside the fishing village that means house of fish. It's real interesting that when we go back into the Old Testament, when Israel was living in rebellion and they were judged by God, God had several ways of referencing their behavior. And he would use symbolic terms to describe how they were going to be judged or how they were acting. And in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 14 there's an interesting reference made to the rebellious people of Israel. If you have your Bibles, turn to Habakkuk 1, verse 14. Look what it says, folks. Now, in this passage of Habakkuk, Habakkuk was asking God, he was questioning God, saying, God, okay, I know that you're going to judge Israel. You're going to judge your people because they deserve it. 
They've been disobedient. But the thing I don't understand, God, is why do you pick a neighboring country who is even more evil than your people Israel? You pick people who are pagans or heathens. Their evil is worse than Israel's. And it seems like you don't even look at how they act and you ignore how they act. And then you allow them to come and punish Israel. And God, I don't understand it. Why do you allow this? And that may seem like a, a dangerous thing for a prophet to ask God, for a prophet to question God. But God had patience with Habakkuk and he explained why. When Habakkuk was asking about it, he said, you're from everlasting God, you, you're pure, you're holy. But when you marked Israel for judgment, for correction, and you appointed them for judgment because you don't like to look at their wickedness and you don't like to see their evil, but why do you look, and this is found in Habakkuk 1.13, look what it says. Why do you look on those, he's talking about Babylon, who deal treacherously, and but you hold your tongue when they, the wicked ones, devour a purchase more righteous than them? Why do you not say anything when Babylon devours Israel and Israel is more righteous than Babylon? Why do you not say anything, God? And, and then he goes on in verse 14, he says, why do you make men like fish of the sea. Now he's talking about Israel. Watch this, folks. Why do you make the men of Israel like the fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? You make them like fish, and then verse 15, and since they are like fish, they can't defend themselves, so the Babylonians come in, and he says this in verse 15, and they take all of them up with a hook and catch them in a net. They gather them in a net, and the Babylonians rejoice that they caught them. You have Israel like little fish, God, why? And why do you let Babylon win? I don't understand. So God explained the answer. And basically his answer was, well, if I told you, you wouldn't understand. These things are way above you. In summary, it's because Israel knew better. Yeah, Israel was more righteous than Babylon, even when they were disobedient, because they still had part of God's law that they followed. But since they had the law, then they were without excuse. Since they knew better, then they were sinning against knowledge. The Babylonians don't have the law of God, so that's why I deal with them differently. That's what God was telling Habakkuk. So what I'm trying to say here, folks, is we have a reference in the Old Testament to Israel when Israel was taken captive by Babylon. And from the time that they were taken captive, for 70 years they were in Babylon, and then they were set free. Some of them came back. And then after that, it was just a bumpy ride of trying to survive. It was very difficult. But God made reference to Israel being like fish. Fish being judged. Fish who had no protection. Fish who were vulnerable. And fish who were appointed for correction and chastisement and judgment. So the condition of Israel were as fish to be caught in a net. Now, let's move forward several hundred years. Jesus shows up. Jesus is in his ministry. And he feeds 5,000 people who were historically in the Bible referenced as fish, but now you have 5,000 people in a desolate place having no shepherd. These are now the descendants of those who were considered fish for judgment. And now here they are in the outskirts, ladies and gentlemen, of the house of fish. The word Bethsaida means house of fish. And when we look at how the multitudes were there, below the surface, God is saying something. God is saying, in the past, you were just fish. But now you are a multitude of people and you have nobody to lead you. You are the descendants and now you are the sheep of Israel. It's time for you to have a shepherd. It's time for you to go from the children of judgment into children that need a shepherd. There's a transition that takes place there. And we see the reference for fish meaning people. As I stated earlier, I will make you fishers of men. Jesus said that to the disciples. And then at the very end of John. So, there is a symbolic representation of fish. Now, while we are on the subject of fish, folks, I want to say something that's kind of spooky. Some of you may not have thought about this before. For those of you that have studied the end times, there are signs that are taking place all around us. There shall be wars, rumors of war, earthquakes, pestilence, etc. We know about those. You know about them. You know about the signs. But there's another prophecy that's been given to us that many of you have heard about and we see it taking place right now. And while we do see it taking place, 
we do see it as a token from God, a sign from God that, hey, this is what time it is. And this sign does speak for itself. However, with the information that I just shared, I want to show you a deeper meaning to this sign. And this sign is found in the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 3. And in this verse, we can read about the animals that will die at the end of time. It's one of the signs. Let me just read the verse. If you have Hosea, are you taking notes? Hosea 4, 3. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away. With the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea will be taken away. Birds dying, we've seen that happen. There's stories in the news where birds will just fall out of the sky or people will wake up in their town and there's hundreds or thousands of birds dead all over the street and over farmland, over the city. And we're also seeing that there are fish kills that are going on in different parts of the world, across America, in some of the lakes in America, and some of the rivers, in South America, it's happening in Asia, Europe. This thing is happening all around the world where fish are dying. Some of you have read them and associated it with this prophecy. And it is a part of this prophecy. But folks, let me share something. And let's look at it a little bit deeper. Usually when a judgment happens in the natural, in the physical realm where we live and breathe, there's usually a spiritual, symbolic, metaphoric layer under it. For example, when when the people got tired of eating the manna, and they said, we want flesh, we want meat, we're tired of the manna. So God sent them quail, and they started eating the meat that they wanted, but they ate so much that they got food poisoning, and they got sick, and thousands and thousands of the, the people died because they got sick from eating the quail. And the sickness was a horrible sickness. It says that they were vomiting, and in fact, the vomit was coming out of their nose. So the judgment here was because they didn't want the manna from God, the meat from heaven, and instead they chose the flesh of the earth, then the flesh of the earth made them sick. So there's a, a physical, the flesh, the, the quail, made them sick because they didn't want the manna. And in the same way, when we look at the fish dying around the world, now we just read in the book of Habakkuk, fish can represent the people getting judged and carried away. Fish represent the people under judgment. In Israel's case, we read that. Now, when we look at the end times and we see fish dying, if fish represented Israel back then, ladies and gentlemen, then I propose this. Fish represent the multitudes of the earth. That's why we can read in, in Revelation that a lot of the fish are going to die in the sea. That is a, a token sign of the people that are going to die. A third of the fish die, a third of the people die. So, Fish represent the judgment that's going to happen to people. So when we read in Hosea 4.3, even the fish and the sea will be taken away. And then when we see fish that are dying right now around the world, you know what that means, folks? That means that judgment over a lot of people is going to take place. That is a token sign that people are going to be dying in similar fashion that will number into the thousands. When you see a fish kill and they see 10,000, that is a token sign that that many people eventually are going to die when the judgment becomes a manifestation of the dying fish. So that's a side note, ladies and gentlemen. You see, folks, the Bible is alive. There are layers to it. This thing is real. So going back to the account of the feeding of the multitude, what do we have? Jesus wanted to be alone. He wanted to rest. He went to the north shore, northeastern shore, to Bethsaida, which means the house of fish, and then the multitude showed up so when Jesus saw them, he was moved with compassion because they were like sheep having no shepherd. And it also says something else when he saw them. And here's what's beautiful. In the book of Mark, it says when he saw them, he began to teach them many things. And then when we look at the account in Luke, by the way, if you have a piece of paper, you can place it in each one of these sections so you can just go back and forth as we're looking at these. So the sections are Matthew 14, Mark 6. If you have something to just place in there, get a pencil or a napkin or something. Also in Luke 9 and then John chapter 6. Now, so far it says he had compassion on them. They were like sheep having no shepherd. Mark 6 says he began to teach them many things, so he taught them. We don't even know what he taught them, folks. It must have been pretty incredible, though. But look what Luke 9 says. It says that he did three things for the multitude. In verse 11, 9 and 11. Hey, I just saw that. Interesting. But when the multitude knew it, they followed him. And he received them. Number one, he received them. Number two, he spoke to them about what? 
the kingdom of God. So he received them, spoke to them, and then number three, and he healed those who had a need of healing. Wow, this is what Jesus does for the multitude, for the people. Now, on the surface, when we, we see this, we see it as, okay, well, he did these three things. It was a big picnic. It was like a conference. It was a an outdoor gathering for Jesus. And when we look at the surface layer of Jesus taught him, he healed them, and he told them about the kingdom of God, and he received them. But we're not just looking at these verses to look at the surface, folks. We're gleaning the nuggets that are incorporated in this account. And when we look at the, the account of Luke, there's something that's real interesting. It supports the incredible mission of the gospel in the life of Jesus. What does that mean? When I say the gospel, I'm talking about how people can find Jesus. The hints of how you can find Jesus are here, ladies and gentlemen. If you are looking for Jesus, if you're looking for more, if you want more from your relationship with Jesus, and right now you don't quite feel that you're where you're supposed to be, and you're examining your relationship and it's not where you want, but you wish you had some nuggets of truth or you, you wish that you had some information or something to just help you along, we can find the things that will help you along over and over in the Gospels, in the life of Jesus. We can find it right here. And in Luke 9, 11, we find how someone can meet Jesus and be ministered by him. It's right here, folks. Now look what it says. When the multitudes knew it, okay, number one, Here's the gospel right here. Here's how to have a relationship and to find Jesus. You want more of Jesus? Here it is. Number one, the multitudes knew what Jesus was going to be. They knew it. Meaning, you got to believe it. You got to know and believe that Jesus is there. You want to find Jesus? Number one, you got to know that he's there and believe that he's going to be there. Now, the multitude could see him. They knew he was there, so they knew it. There's no doubt. If you want to have a relationship with Jesus and you take it casually like, well, I'm not sure you're God. I'm not sure you really did this cross thing and this crucifixion. I'm not sure. You know what, folks? If you're not sure, then you don't have faith. The seed of faith has not been watered in your heart yet. You got to know that Jesus is the only way because you know what, folks? He is the only way. There is no other way to come to God. There is no other way that man can come to God to meet the Father. There is no other connection. It is not the New Age. It is not Buddha. It is not Confucius and New Age mysticism or paganism or witchcraft or some of these other cults that are out there. It's not the esoteric arts. It's not casually. It's not through any of the other counterfeits that are out there, folks. There's only one way, and that way is through Jesus because Jesus is real. He came. He lived. He was born. He walked this earth, and he gave himself up for you. Jesus is not an option that you try for a week or a few days and then say, eh, I guess it didn't work for me. If that is the, the nature of your relationship with God, you're not going to make it, my friend. And if that is the condition of your relationship with God, if I was you, I would be fearful. And that would strike terror in my heart. Because it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, ladies and gentlemen. God is shaking this earth now. He is bringing judgment now. He is real. And this earth is ripe for judgment. God is going to bring his whirlwind. God is not a little sissy Santa Claus God. He is the everlasting Alpha and Omega. He is the Ancient of Days. And his eyes can mount mountains like wax. His voice is a thunder that shakes the ground and shakes the earth. And someday he is going to reel this earth to and fro like a drunkard. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is real. And if you are hungry for him and you call out to him, that is faith. You got to have the faith to know he's going to answer. The book of Hebrews tells us that he who comes to God must believe that he is. And he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You must believe that he is. He is the great I am. He is able. So the multitude knew that Jesus was there. And then look at the next part, folks. Look what it says. So what did they do? Scratch their head and stay where they were? Did they say, ah, I'll send up a smoke signal? Did they say, well, if you knew he's there and you're going to go see him, when you get back, let me know how it was. I'm too tired. I got too much stuff to do. This multitude represented people that were hungry. It represents the lost people of earth. And look what they did. They knew it. And they followed him. 
They followed him. They saw him going across the boat, across the water, and they followed along the shore because they wanted to get there. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the next part of salvation. You got to know Jesus is there. When you go into your prayer closet and you pray, you know that he's listening. In your heart of hearts, you know that he is there. There is no doubt. And it's not just knowing it. You see, some people stop there. Some people, in their relationship with Jesus, they they go to church because they know he's at church and they are doing their duty. You know, I got to go to church. I got to take the kids to church. We go to church because Jesus is there. So they're doing the first part. They know he's there, but they're not following. They're not following him. The people here follow Jesus. Now, the word follow, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said over and over, if you want the kingdom of God, what do you do? You just walk behind me and watch me heal people and some of the crumbs might fall in your lap maybe every now and then. It'll be fun and exciting. You get to see people healed and it's all glorious. Is that what Jesus said? No. Jesus said, if you want to be a part of me, take up your cross and follow me. We got to follow Jesus on the Via Dolorosa, ladies and gentlemen. The cross means we look in the mirror. The cross means denial of the things that our flesh wants. The cross means that you don't get to do what your flesh wants. Just because the flesh wants it doesn't mean you get to do it. The cross means denial of the things that man places above God. The cross means denial of the things of this earth that want to tempt you and overcome you. Following Jesus includes the cross. You cannot follow Jesus without the cross, my friend. Following Jesus is the whole package. You got to follow him with the cross on your back, carrying it. So here we have verse 11. The multitudes knew he was there and then they followed him. And when they followed him, did he turn them away? Did he say, oh, you bunch of drunkards, you bunch of losers. I know you grandparents. They're a bunch of heathens. Your grandparents embarrassed themselves. Your grandparents were an embarrassment to the heritage of the apple of my eye. I don't want anything to do with you. Y'all are a mess. Look at you. You smell like fish. Did Jesus say that, folks? No. It says he received them. Praise God. He received them. He received them up to that point. If you want Jesus to receive you, my friend, some of you are wondering, does God receive me? Does God want me? What's missing? What am I doing wrong? What's left out? What am I skipping? What did I forget? What part of this born again thing am I missing? The sinner's prayer. Where, where did I go wrong? I'm not there. Some of you are wondering. And you're wondering if Jesus doesn't like you. I pray to him and I, the heavens are, my prayers bounce off the ceiling. The heavens are brass, Nathan. It doesn't seem like he's received me because I didn't get a memo. He didn't say Roger that when I sought him. When I prayed to him, I'm not hearing a, I hear you, my son. I hear you talk about it, Nathan. I hear others talk about the experiences, but I don't think he's receiving me. Okay, folks, if that may be you, according to what we see right here, what happened before Jesus received them? They followed him. To follow Jesus is with the cross, meaning denial of everything. To deny yourself and pick up the cross means 100% commitment. It means that you decided that you're tired of doing it your own way. You have decided that Jesus is going to be more important than those friends who keep bringing you down and tempting you. You have decided that those weights that keep bringing you down and and causing you to stumble need to be done away with and forsaken. And you want to bring them to the cross. To follow Jesus means you follow him and you dump everything at the foot of the cross, folks. But the cross is always involved. You want Jesus to receive you, you got to follow him. And then before that, you got to know he's there. You got to believe it. That's faith. The faith of a child. We come to God as a child. A child has no, no problem believing God is real. You tell them about God and Jesus, they have no problem. Their faith isn't all complex and contradictory. They don't question it. God's in heaven. He loves me. Okay, point me. I'll pray. I don't have pride. I don't have things holding me back. Like a child, folks. So the multitude knew it. They followed him and he received them. And then, ladies and gentlemen, when he receives you, he brings you, he opens up his hands and takes you into the fold. And we can read about this gesture over and over. The gesture of him receiving his people because the people come to him. And he opens up his arms and he covers the people with his feathers. Now, in a previous program, we talked about how when Jesus 
wept over Jerusalem and said how often I wanted to gather you as a mother hen gathers her babies, her chicks, and I wanted to cover you with my wings, but you wouldn't have it. You would not have it. When Jesus wept over Jerusalem, it's because they did not come to him. They didn't follow him. They stayed away. They looked at him from afar. They dwelled at a distance. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to be a part of Jesus? You want him to be a part of you? Don't dwell at a distance, folks. Don't dwell from afar. Run to him. Run to the prayer closet. You run to your knees. You shut the door and get on your knees and say, God, I want everything that you have to offer. All of it. So many people today come to God and they out loud or maybe they show it. You know, I did the sinner's prayer. Jesus, I receive you as my savior. Come into my heart. Okay, I'm saved. The Bible doesn't say that, folks. The sinner's prayer is not in there like that. You got to come to Jesus 100%. Follow him and give him your all. 100% pick up the cross, follow him, and have repented before that. Jesus, I'm tired of the mess. I'm dumping my life. I'm dumping all this mess that I've been tolerating and wanting, and I'm going to follow you. Receive me, Jesus. Take me. Take me in. And you bang on the door until he answers. Nathan, I'm not breaking through with God. Then maybe you need to knock harder, my friend. Nathan, I try to pray to God, and I don't get anything. Well, how much time are you trying? Is it one minute? Five minutes? Or do you shut the door? Do you tell your loved ones, don't bother me for a while? Put on some praise music and you say, God, I'm not coming out of this room until you show up. That is the determination God is looking for. Jacob wrestled all night long. When he held on to the angel of the Lord, he refused to let go. And folks, that's the kind of determination we need. Hold on to the horns of the altar with a white knuckle grip. God, I am not letting go. When we come to God that way and you're holding on to the horns of the altar with both hands, It's kind of hard to hold on to the things of the world when you're holding on to the altar. There's a tendency to drop the things of the world at the feet of the cross when you're holding on to the cross. There's a tendency to drop the things of the earth when you lift up your hands toward heaven with open arms and open hands saying, God, give me everything you have. I don't want anything else. When you hold your hands up to God empty, the things of the earth fall to the ground. That's the kind of determination, folks, that we need. And the multitude had that. They were hungry. They knew he was there. They followed him and he received them. And then what did Jesus do? He spoke to them about what? The kingdom of God. Nathan, I want to know about God. I want to know about the Bible, but I don't understand it. I don't don't get it. If you follow God with determination and he receives you, he's going to tell you about the kingdom. The Holy Spirit will show you, but it requires the effort Now, folks, think about this. They ran for miles and miles toward Jesus. All they knew is, I got to get there. This is the Messiah. I want to get there. They followed him. And then they listened. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And several hours went by and he kept talking. And then hours went by. He kept talking. They forgot that they missed their lunch. He kept talking. Started getting later. He kept talking. And also he healed those who needed healing because they followed him. Now, Already, folks, we're gleaning some incredible things. And we're just in the third verse of the feeding of the 5,000. We haven't even got to the the feeding part yet. And look what we have here. So what happened next? It started to get later and later. Luke tells us, When the day began to wear away, the twelve came to him. And they said, Send the multitude away. Send them away, Jesus. So they can go into the surrounding towns and lodge and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place here. We're in a deserted place here, Jesus. That's the account from Luke. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat because we're in the wilderness, in a deserted place. Now, ladies and gentlemen, right there is an incredible nugget of truth that we can glean from. There's a lot of information right here. The people had been with Jesus all day long and they had not eaten anything physical. So in a way they were fasting. They were denying their body. They were denying themselves because they were with Jesus all day, denying the flesh. The disciples noticed that it was late. And by the way, I want to give them kudos. They deserve some credit because this showed that they cared. They cared that the people were hungry. So they had somewhat of a a compassion for them. And they also noticed the hour was late. They didn't want the people walking in the dark. But what do we have so far? When you deny your flesh and you you go to Jesus, you spend time with him denying your flesh. Here's another spiritual truth. When 
we go to God and we've been denying our flesh, God never, never, never refuses to show up. God will not send you away without touching you. He will not do it. They were in a desolate place denying their flesh. Another thing to glean from this, if you are denying your flesh and you're fasting and you're seeking God, God's going to show up. If you are determined for him and you've done everything up to this point, denial, following, he's teaching you, you're, you're reading the word, God will not send you away without feeding you, my friend. He won't. Because what we read next proves it to us. Now, this is very significant. Fasting, denying the flesh, is one way to give you a jump start to get on the fast track of getting stronger with God. If some of you have been struggling, you know, with some sins, and I know that you're out there, you email me and you tell me, there's a lot of, today in Babylon, the temptation of the flesh is incredible. I know the bombardment of the flesh from advertising and the computers, the internet, all the stuff that's out there of the flesh is very tempting. And some of you email me and you say, Nathan, I can't get victory. I don't know what to do. I pray. Well, we have part of the formula right here, folks. Getting away with Jesus only. That means getting away from the things of Babylon, getting away from the TV, getting away from the computer, getting away from the entertainment, your friends, and you go into the wilderness with Jesus and deny your flesh for a while. When you do that, you ask God to strengthen you. He's going to do it. He's not going to send you away empty. He won't. He will not send you away as an empty vessel. And right here proves it because God has compassion on those who seek him. Those who are hungry, he will feed. One thing that I want to add, ladies and gentlemen, is for those of you that are shut-ins or you live in a rural place, you live alone, you live far away from everything and you're hungry for God, you're in the wilderness, you feel desolate, there's good news, my friend. Your situation is ripe for getting blessed by God. Your situation is ripe for the blessings of God and the feeding of God and the nourishment of God to come your way. Because I find the formula of the wilderness of when people in Scripture got away to seek God alone, that's when things happened. That's when God showed up. So if you may be there right now and God hasn't showed up yet, don't give up. Continue seeking Him and He will show up because He promises he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him, ladies and gentlemen. He'll show up at the right time. He'll show up on time. Now, as the account continues, the disciples said, send him into the village so they can get provisions and go stay at the La Quinta Inn and the Holiday Inn. And Jesus, it's getting late. We've got to feed him. What do we do? Send him away, Jesus. And here it is, folks. Jesus does not send you away without feeding. He won't. Now. When Jesus asked Philip, John 6, 5, Jesus said, well, where shall we buy some bread, Philip, so that they can eat? The disciples before that said, Jesus, let's send them away so they can eat. So, Philip, where shall we buy the bread? Now, when Jesus said that, it says he knew what he was going to do. He, he was testing Philip. He was really testing all of the disciples. Verse 6 says that, but he said this to test him, for he knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to feed the multitude, and we've read it. We, we know he does. But before he did it, he asked Philip, and the disciples heard, where will we buy bread? Jesus wants us to go buy bread? Can you imagine, folks? The disciples are standing around, and they hear Jesus ask Philip, where are we going to buy the bread? And the disciples then look at each other. They look at the crowd and see 10,000, 12,000 people, however many it was, over five for sure. They see 5,000 to 10,000 people, and they're thinking, Jesus just asked them, where are we going to buy their meal, their dinner? Uh, what? What's Jesus thinking? They heard him ask the question. By the way, side note, when you have a project you're working on with God, or you're in the middle of a project, and you believe you have all the instructions, and then you get to a certain point that's kind of a roadblock of the project that you believe God has you doing, it's a roadblock. It's in the way. Has that happened to you folks? Well, if it has, when God asks you, you see, we have the, the main project, but then when God asks you about a particular part of it, when he asks you, how are you going to do that? Sometimes it may be a test of faith because he, he tested Philip. And Philip answered, he said, well, Jesus, 200 denarii worth of bread is not enough. That's not enough money to buy food for everyone. Not 200. 
And even that would not be enough to fill them. It would just be a little bit. So Philip brought up 200 denarii. One denarii was a day's wage. And when we look at today, one day's wage is $100, maybe 200 depending on what your occupation is. But a two-parent income on the low end, it's $1 to $200 a day. So the value of a denarii was about $1 to $200. If we multiply that by 200 days or 200 denarii, that's almost two-thirds of a year's income, approximately, for lower middle-class people. And Philip was saying, that's a lot of money. So, Lord, how are we going to do this? How? That's not enough. We can't afford that. And Jesus said this to test him and to test all of them. Where are we going to get the food to fill them? Where are we going to get the bread? Uh, you could make money appear. Uh, you could make gold appear and multiply money or... I don't know, just say a prayer and they'll all be full. Or I don't know, Jesus, um, they didn't know. They were looking at it in the physical. And looking at it in the physical, they were thinking there's no way, using the rules and logic of man, that it could be done. No way, Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to say this. Based on what we see right here, the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Messiah, Alpha and Omega, the door, He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life, he is the way, folks. He is the one who makes a way when there is no way. He's the one that makes the way for you. So those of you that are looking at a situation that needs a miracle, if your situation is the will of God, and if you are in his will, if you're following and you're obedient and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, God can make a way where there is no way. Because even though people may have a plan A and a plan B, God has a plan M for miracle and a plan H for the Holy Ghost, and he also uses plan P for power. God can, ladies and gentlemen. God is able, and God does not fail. God is not obstructed to the limitations of man and the obstacles of man. But folks, we got to believe, and we got to know that he can do it. It requires that you trust him and that you surrender to him, and then expect your miracle. My friend, do you need a miracle? Jesus can do it. That's the kind of God that we serve. We don't serve a dead, anemic God that can't do anything. We serve a God who is alive. And the Bible tells us that in the end of days, God is going to do miracles. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The people that know their God. He can do it, folks. He can do it for you. In the book of Mark, Jesus said, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. Go and see how many loaves. How many? This is a whole other sermon in itself. How much do you have? I know what you don't have, but how much do you have? Interesting how, huh, folks, God doesn't say, how much do you not have? He says, how much do you have? How much do you have? He doesn't say, how much faith do you lack? He says, how much faith do you have? He doesn't say, how much unbelief do you have? He says, how much belief do you have? How much do you have, my friend? How many promises are you holding on to? How much of the word do you have? How much of a grasp to the hem of his garment do you have? Are you grabbing onto a thread or are you grabbing onto the train of his robe? How much do you have? How much do you have, saints of God? How much do you have? This is the miracle of the gospel message. These next few words right here, ladies and gentlemen, most people have not seen it, but the treasures that are found in Scripture, and especially the treasures that are found in the life of Jesus, are so incredible. When Jesus said, how much do you have? They answered him. And the answer that they gave is the gospel. Today, some people who go to church don't even really know this message. And here's the message, folks. The message of the gospel includes the human condition that humans are destined for destruction. The gospel message includes the problem of, of sin-tainted souls. The gospel message includes that we all have a need for restoration. Humankind needs to be restored and redeemed. We need restoration, folks. But the nice gospel that is out there whitewashing everything says that it's all good. It's all good. Everything's great. All you guys are, are great. Jesus sees you as great. Today, the purpose-driven gospel is missing 
the true message of redemption and the true message that God wants to relay to all of us. The true message that includes the cross. And all of those messages I just mentioned are in the next portion of this account. This next portion, ladies and gentlemen, has so much. This next portion includes the required journey of the suffering of Jesus. The suffering of Jesus. Because the suffering of Jesus required that his body be broken. It required that his body was going to be broken and whipped and mistreated and abused and despised and rejected of man and then crucified. The journey of Jesus required that he walk along his road and his chosen path that he willingly went through, carrying his cross through a crowd of betrayers, through a crowd of haters and mockers who would esteem him not. And his, his journey required him to experience pain, insurmountable pain, probably the worst pain of all creation that no man has ever come close to experiencing because the pain that Jesus carried included the exile of carrying the weight of every sin that every human had ever committed. All the weight of oppression and vexation for all of humanity. Jesus carried that. That was his price. And God wants every one of us to understand this. He wants you to understand this and embrace it. Nathan, we're just talking about the feeding of the multitude. What are you talking about? What do you mean everything you just said? How can that be in the feeding? Because I know the answer that's about to happen. Jesus said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Go see. Go and see. Don't stay right here. Pursue the answer. How many loaves were there, folks? Go see. We must look for the loaves of God. Go and see. Jesus told them to go. Go, the word go requires effort. The word go requires a journey. The word go requires a discipline for us to be involved. It requires that you're involved and you get up and you start walking to go and see. To go and see means that we have to seek and observe it. Go and see. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the bread, the loaves represent Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. Most of you know that already. But when Jesus said, how many do you have? Go and look. He was saying, how much of God do you have? How much of my bread? How much of me? How much of my nourishment? How much of, of what I have to offer do you have? Go see. In order to go and see requires the willingness that we go to look, to find, and to be honest with what we see. I see a lot of you, Jesus, there. Out there I see a lot, but how much do I have? Mark 6, 38. If we know that Jesus is the bread of life, then the word loaves could really be Jesus. Now, folks, please consider this for a moment. If Jesus reworded this and we were looking below the layer, which we are doing right now, because the loaves do represent him, but if Jesus, instead of saying loaves, if he said, how much of me do you have? Go and see. What would you tell him? How much of me do you have? If Jesus were to ask you that, what would you say? My friend of the faith out there, wherever you are, how much of Jesus do you have? How much? Go and see. To ask that question to ourselves means that we're asking it, but we're not just answering out of the top of our head. The question requires that we also take a look and see. We have to look and see how much we have. It means we have to look in the mirror. We have to look inside. We have to open up the hatch and look inside. Look within. Look inside ourselves. Folks, can you do that? How many of you can do that? Look inside yourself and answer this question. How much of Jesus do you have? Go see. Is it enough? Is it a lot? Is it a little bit? When was the last time you looked? When was the last time you took inventory? How much of Jesus do you have? How much? 
Nathan, I don't want to, I don't want to say. And my friend, if you do go and see and you see that it's not that much, are you satisfied with that? Is that okay? Do you tell your loved ones they need to have a lot when you don't? Do you put pressure pressure on your spouse and you wish they had more, but you really don't yourself? Do you wish your kids had more, but you don't? Do you wish you had more to give? Do you say, if only I had more, then I could solve this mess? If only I had more of Jesus. If only. I'm asking hard questions, folks, because... This is what this message is for. It's so that we don't pretend. It's so that we look inward, so that we deal with the things of God and we do business with God. Mark 6, 38. But Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. At this point in the message, we need to stop, especially in this late hour, and take a look, a real look. It's time, folks. It's time to take a a hard look, an honest look, a timely look to see what we have, to see how much we have, to see what is within us. Because if some of you who are struggling out there do not have enough, in fact, this applies to all of us. In order to endure the hard road that's ahead, in order to be able to see through the darkness, and in order to be able to have our lamps full, we have to have enough of Him to fill our lamps. Because if we don't, If we don't have enough loaves of the bread of life of Jesus, how are you going to be nourished, my friend, to sustain the bumpy ride that's ahead? How will you have enough to to share with others? The lack of Jesus plays out in a lack to endure. The lack of Jesus plays out in the condition of weary souls. The lack of Jesus, it plays out in not having the endurance to walk the walk, to stay on the road, to keep focused. How much do you have, my friend? Go and see. Go and see if you have enough to endure this mess. Go and see if you have enough to help others. How much do you have, folks? And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the heart of the matter. For some of you, this may be the missing piece. For some of you, this truth could be what you've needed to deal with. How much of Jesus do you have, my friend? Go and see. And as you do, let's do business with God. Let's do business with the Master. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. I thank you for your word. Lord, your word is so beautiful that it can open up truths and challenges, that it can help us to look inward, that it can help us to see that without you, there's nowhere to go. So God, show us that we need more of you. And for those of us that do need more, God, let us seek you. Let us follow you. Let us meet you where you are. And let us take time to stay for a while with you. God, for those that are listening, those that are weak, those that are struggling in their walk, those that are hurting, God, let your Holy Spirit draw them. God, minister, touch, restore, and strengthen those who need a touch from you as they go and see. And I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be the first portion of a multi-part message, and I have a lot more to present to you. So this is going to be part one. Part two is going to be coming out pretty soon in a few days, so keep checking back. Folks, take these matters to heart. For those of you that appreciate our efforts here at Watchman's Cry, we appreciate your gifts of support. Our address is Watchman's Cry, P.O. Box 157, Priest River, Idaho, 83856, or you can go to our website and contact us there at watchmanscry.com. If you want to be notified of the next message, go to our website and subscribe to notifications, and I'll let you know when it comes out. Folks, right now there's a lot of news that can shake and discourage, so I want to encourage you folks keep seeking spiritual food. And that's what these meals are for. I want to encourage you folks to remember the spiritual part of yourself. Keep it strong. So with that, stay safe, stay vigilant, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.